Welcome to this episode of Chatting with Stacks. I'm your host, Bill Stacks, and today I got Jack O'Halloran. A lot of people know him from Superman, King Kong, Dragnet, but there's something about Jack you might not know. He is the son of Albert Anastasia, and he's going to explain himself. What's up, Jack? How are you? Hey, how are you doing? So, um, you thank doing? you so much for Indeed. coming on my show. I appreciate hey, it. Hey, it's my pleasure. So, a lot of people might know you from different movies you've been in, like Dragnet and King Kong and Superman. But something people might not know about you is who your father was. Pretty interesting guy. Yeah. <laughs> So do you want to explain maybe the first time that you heard about your father and and what that was like for you in the beginning? Well, I mean, you, he was always in the newspapers. Everybody you knew who he was, but I didn't know he was, you know, the, other than the individual that he put around me that was watching over me and teaching me stuff from the time I was young. Uh alluded to certain things that, you know, but no, no one ever really stated it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, until um, he showed up one day and uh, that was quite a shock. And then I was supposed to meet him in New York a week later. And unfortunately that's when they assassinated him, but he knew it was coming. You know, that's, uh, that's why I, I think he came down and, and saw me and, uh, and, and explained some things to me and, told me that my life would be good and everybody would be, it'd be all fine. So, uh, it was so, a very interesting man. After he gets murdered, do you have that revenge on your mind? Are you like, I, I don't care. I want to get revenge on these people. Well, I wasn't a happy puppy. That's for sure. You know, and, uh, and I, and I didn't realize I was just, beginning to understand that world and, uh, and then I was taken under wing by Meyer Lansky and uh, Frank Costello and uh, and a lot of things were explained to me and the more I learned and the more I, I saw and the more I saw that nobody was doing anything about it you know that uh, the law wasn't doing anything about it and uh, nobody from the street was doing anything about it and uh, and that kind of upset me quite a bit and uh, and they told me that I should just leave it alone, and you know, but I, I just couldn't do that. So, what was the reason they said your father was killed? He died because he wouldn't accept the drug business, and he controlled the harbors. And he said, "You're not bringing that stuff in on my watch." You know, he uh, he just wasn't. And he was, and, and the Anastasia family was a powerful family. Uh, after they assassinated him, Carl Gambino was his underboss, and. And it became the Gambino family, and yeah. uh, which is one of the most powerful families in in, in the five families. So, you know, it was uh, Albert. But they made a very bad mistake, and they realized that after it was done, uh, because he was the glue that held everything together. You know, from Murder Inc. and and, and the fear that was instilled in people. Uh, and we're talking about all people in the families, and not innocent people walking around, but people who uh, were involved in all the business that the families were involved in. He kept they kept people the in line, right? He kept them in Sorry? line. He kept them in line. Yeah. They were the policemen, you know, for, for, for all the family business. And, uh, and it worked for a long time. It worked very well, you know, but uh, once he was gone, everybody started uh, who shot John and they started killing each other and the foolishly greed, you know, greed's an amazing thing. And they, they all got involved in this. They thought there was such easy money in the drug business and it was such an easy thing. They forgot how to make money. You know, they had systems set out where they, they did very well. You know, they, they controlled the waterfronts. They controlled a lot of things. And there was a, a lot of revenue stream that uh, just went by the wayside because they got more interested in, in, in drugs and prostitution. It was very stupid. What about when Frank, there was an attempt on Frank Costello's life. Do you remember when that happened? They tried to kill Frank. Chin, the Chin tried to kill Frank because he he held the most powerful political book and connections. 
and and he sat them down and he said, you know, we're going to lose all these connections if you don't put this drug business aside because, uh, you know, they, they tolerate a lot of things that we do because we help each other out, but they're not going to tolerate this drug business. And uh, the sad part is that the government was more involved in it than, than anybody else. So do you think that the drugs really destroyed the mob and, and that life? Oh, yeah. I think it I think it changed it. You know, it didn't totally destroy it, but it certainly changed it. And there's people who people who were seriously involved in a lot of things became legitimate in a lot of ways. I mean, they still had their connections and ways of doing things, but in a way they became legitimate, you know. And, yeah. Uh, because they ran businesses and, and knew that they, you know, there, there's the things you had to walk away from because when they put the uh, certain laws in, you know, uh, that that were just really not even for them, but they used it against them uh, for conspiracy deals and stuff like that. You know, they just they would throw your name in a pot and say, well, and, and I knew a lot of guys that, that stood up and wouldn't talk and wouldn't say this and wouldn't say that. And they wound up doing 30, 40 years in jail because they like, would never talk. Like well, uh, Genovese did, right? He went to prison for a long time. Genovese, for drugs. Gen Genovese deserved to die. He deserved to go to prison. I mean, I mean he was, uh, he was the, he was the pit of the problem. He was in the thirties when he was deported, he went to Sicily and he put a plant in down there where they were distributing heroin from. And in fact, the, the old timers were so against it that the people that were working for him and, and bringing it, stuff into America were not allowed to be called Italians. They were called Zips. That was the name that they had. They were Zips. Yeah. And uh, it was, uh, you know, something had to be done uh, to cease it. And, and, and you had to, something had to be done to, you know, Genovese had to stay in jail until he died, which is what happened. So as you're growing things. up as a young man, what's what's your life like? Like, where are you going after your father's killed? Like, where where do you go? And like, um, what was your your professional career well, looking like? You know, like what I, did you I want to do? Own... I, I you know I when I was. When I was young, when I was in the teenage years and stuff, you know, I had a lot of when I knew and realized who I was and where I came from. And I had a partner of mine, Joe Costello, from we, we down in Wildwood, New Jersey. We spent the summers down there every year. So we put together a protection thing for guys on the boardwalk and because the shops wouldn't get shoplifted. And, and we put together the bouncers for clubs and stuff like that. And, uh, Your camera's and off. Your camera turned off. I know. Why? I don't know. There's a so there's a button. You'll be able to hit it and turn it back on. I'm It'll say cam. It It'll say cam. Yeah. Cam. Look at that. It should uh, be right here. Hold on. Let me see. It should be right here, but it's not. Are you on a laptop or a phone? I'm on a laptop. Oh, you're on a laptop. Yeah. Oh, it should be it should down be in the front. It should be a thing that says doesn't say it though. Huh. That's weird. I don't know. I can't start your camera. It won't let me. I can only mute your mic. Oh, there there we you go. got it. You got it. Okay. Um, so you guys were giving protection to people on the boardwalk. How old were yeah. you around that time? Well, I was about 15, 16 years old, 17. You know, that every summer we increased our business. It was pretty good. And we took care of business very well. You know, we did didn't shake anybody down or anything. We really we really stopped people from from uh, stealing from people and, and for disturbing their businesses. Oh, so if people we, would like break windows or something, you guys would stop well, them. Well they, they would shoplift and they would, you know, they would interfere with uh, there was a lot of stalls on the boardwalk, you know, shooting galleries and, and pitch things and there was all kinds of things that people were trying to uh, manipulate them and, and shake them down and stuff. And, uh, so we, we put an end to a lot of that. Yeah. 
So did and, you want to uh, be an actor so back then? It worked out pretty well. It was a revenue stream. Did you have acting Never in thought about it. No? I, I, I like the film business. I'll, I mean, I like films. I studied films a lot. I, I liked looking, you know, watching films and watching actors and, you know, certain people. I, and I don't know. It was like in my subconscious. I never thought about doing it myself, you know. Yeah. Um, but it, it, it gave me a, a way of, of putting a persona across, you know. <laughs> I would watch certain films like Edward G. Robinson and all of them. And it gave me a way of handling things that I did in the street, which was kind of cool, you know. Yeah. But uh, I mean, it, everything in life is a learning, learning edge. You know, you, you you learn from wherever. And I was very fortunate to have people like Lansky and them around me that I learned from the best. I mean, they were. Meyer Lansky was one of the smartest men I ever met. They steer you, know, you in the right direction, man. right? Pardon? They steer you in the right direction. Yeah. Well, they, they taught me how to stay out of jail. They, they taught me a lot of things that were very important, and uh, and it worked very well. And I listened to them very well. I, I I had a lot of respect for them. You know, I like Frank. Frank was a very smart man, and so was Meyer. And then there, I got involved with I got there, friendly with Raymond Patriarca and, and some other people, and and I went across the country actually, and I met everybody. I was they sent me across the country to meet people. Just to, if I was in Detroit, or if I was in Chicago, or if I was in some places, you know, I had uh, people that I could talk to, people that I could relate to. And uh, if I had any like, problems there, I had people that would sort it out, you know. Like Jimmy Hoffa was one of them, right? Jimmy, Jimmy was a good friend. Jimmy, I like Jimmy. Jimmy was, Jimmy was a man's man. Jimmy, Jimmy Hoffa would never ask you to do what he couldn't do himself. And, and he did a tremendous amount of me. You know, stop and think what he actually did. He, in the before Hoffa, if you were a truck driver, you were working like 18, 20 hours a day. You were loading a truck, unloading a truck, driving it. I mean, you were doing all the work and getting paid very little. And yeah. he put a stop to that. And he, and it got to where all they did was drive trucks. They didn't unload them. They didn't load them. They just drove them from one place to another. And other people, did the unloading and the loading and it was all involved. And he put the teamster together very well, you know, and it was, I mean, there were guys, there were lawyers and businessmen who quit business office jobs just to be outside driving a truck in the open air. Wow. Because all they had to do was drive, you know, they did was a great way of life and they made a lot of money. They got paid very well just for driving a truck cross country. You know what I'm saying? Do you so remember it, that? That was around the 60s, right? Around the 60s? Yeah, the 50s and the 60s. And Hoffa put the pension fund together. You know, they, they, they helped build Las Vegas. They helped a lot of things. They helped a lot of people, you know. And, they, and what they put him away for was ludicrous. I mean, the, the, to say that he stole $8,000 from the pension fund to fix his house is the stupidest <laughs> thing I ever heard because... If Jimmy had a problem in his house, there were people that would want to fix it for nothing. Yeah. But they loved him. You know, he was he was very well respected and loved, you know. And he I remember when the day he went away to Lewisburg, all the Teamsters lined their trucks up all the way up to Lewisburg, honking their horns as he went by in a, in adulation to him. The country came to a standstill that day because nothing, no freight moved. All these guys just tr lined up and saying goodbye to him because he was he was going to jail, and you know, and, and he. Some people thought he shouldn't have went, and and he said, "Well, if I did the crime, I'll do the time." And you know, and, and he didn't think that he would be there for a couple months, and they would sort it out. But he wound up being there a few years because he backed the wrong president, you know, and they and and the Kennedys didn't want him on the street because he controlled too much vote. You know, and they, teachers were, were huge. they were trying to keep him out of it, right? They were trying to keep him away from it, and he wanted, they wanted to keep, to keep him away from it because he was he yeah. was a man's man. Jimmy was very revered by people. He was a man's man. He was he was a good person. I liked Jimmy a lot. Do you remember when he went missing? Yeah. And what was yeah, that he, like? Jimmy was his own worst enemy. He, he was he caused his own problem. He, he got a, when he came home from jail. 
he signed a very bad agreement to get out of jail. And which meant he couldn't touch the Teamsters. He couldn't go near it. He wasn't allowed to go there. He wasn't allowed in the office. And, and he walked right into his office and he told him, get out of my chair, boy. You know, uh, this is my union. I'm taking it back. And they said, Jimmy, you, you, you signed an agreement. You can't, you're going to get us in trouble. He said, get out of my office. And he got a phone call from New York and uh, they, he, he got into an argument over the phone and he, you know, they, they said, Jimmy, just give it a little bit of time. We'll sort it out. Everything will work out fine. He said, I don't want to hear that. I want my union back. I want it back now. It's mine. Uh, and I don't like what you're doing with it. And, and he didn't. They, 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 you know, they just were, they, uh, they were, there was too much influence, the government and the union now. And he didn't like where it was going. So he wanted to take it back. And he got in the argument with the guy over the phone and they, and he, you know, they, he said, you know, when you people wanted money for Vegas, we gave it to you. But they paid every one of those loans back, you know, and uh, and he, they they lent the money for Caesar's Palace. I came out of the pension fund. Yeah, a lot and of people had their people. hands in the pension, right? Well, they did after he went to jail. Then it got Fitzsimmons was really they scared Fitzsimmons to death. They blew up his son's car and it, they they scared him to death, and they took control of a lot of things that Jimmy would never allow to happen. And yeah. so he did, on the phone call, he, you know, he started arguing back and forth. And they said, Jimmy, please, you're on the phone. Just give it some time and we'll sort it out. And he said, you know, the hell with this. I'll go to the press. And then the guy just hung the phone up. And, uh, that was the end of Jimmy Hoffa. Wow. So it was you're very sad. It, it, it is because I could tell he was he seemed like a great guy. From what I could tell, he was an incredible guy. He was—he was actually—he was, actually, was an incredible individual, and, uh, and he did a lot for the working man of the country. They should never ever forget that. He—he he took them, he took them from one place and put them into a very good position. You know, Teamster yeah. Teamster guys make a lot of money and they do well. That's all because of Hoffa. Yeah, he you know, left if you're a, a Teamster driver. If you're a teamster driver on a film and you, you you drive from one side of the city to the other, you're getting paid tremendous money to drive across the street, pick something up, and bring it back. You know, it's a, it's just a, it's sad. It was, it was a sad. It was a turn. Another get. It's like another turning of events. You know, of yeah. the country. It was another thing to turn things around in not a good way. Yeah, just like the What's Kennedy the assassination and all that stuff. You do remember when no, that happened? Jack Kennedy was, uh, I like Jack Kennedy, but his father was the problem. His father, his father fell in the control of Chicago back in, in Prohibition era. And this is, nobody ever talks about this. You know, Joe Kennedy was a very, very bright guy. And, and I mean, he was a smart man. In fact, he was the youngest head of a, a president of a bank in the history of banking. He, he, was, he was married to Rose Fitzgerald, who was, Honey Fitzgerald was a, a gangster from Ireland who came to America and did very well. He owned the Bank of England. He became a senator. He was a, a very strong political guy. and He controlled, he dug out the Boston Harbor. He, he made it much more lucrative. And, um, and, he, and Joe Kennedy married him. He he put him ahead of a bank and then prohibition came in but he also controlled all the liquor coming out of Scotland and everything. So when prohibition happened, Joe Kennedy and a guy from Newark, New Jersey that owned Fleischmann's liquor went up to Canada and they had a warehouse and they were taking the booze up to Canada and then they were bringing it back into America, bootlegging. It. And there was a load of booze that he was, that was assigned to some people called the Purple Gang, were a very strong, very strong group out of Detroit. And Joe Kennedy found a better buyer and, and swiped the, the load and sold it to the other guys. And the Purple Gang were very annoyed. And they said to him, you're a dead man, sunshine. And he ran home to Honey Fitzgerald and he, and he said, I, I can't help you with this matter. You got, you crossed the wrong people. The only guy that can help you is in Chicago. So he went back to Chicago and sat down with Joe Esposito. And, and he said, you know, you're a very good earner, young man. He said, you know, you go home to Boston 
and I'll take care of the Purple Gang, but you belong to us now. You, you belong to Chicago. And he got involved with a lot of things that they were doing, and they sent him to Hollywood because they owned the film industry. And he uh, he set up he set up the distribution deal for RKO Studios. He put all the Jewish theater owners together to distribute just for RKO. He did a lot of things, but he came involved with Randolph Hearst, and he got involved with a lot of people. And then in 1926, 27, a, the United States, after World War I, we became a war-bearing country, and we started manufacturing war goods, and we took jobs away from Europe. And Europe had invested the money into America to make America grow. And they were very perturbed that they weren't getting a return on their money big enough that they thought. And now they're getting jobs that are being taken away from them and stuff like that. So there was a place in Chicago and Illinois called the Hamilton Club. It was like a political nesting egg for the president and a lot of political people. And they sat Joe Kennedy down and they said, uh, we want you to do something for us. And he stole $5 million from Pathé Newsreel in broad daylight. Nobody ever saw how he did it. No one could, he manipulated the stock and, and he, boom. So they said, that's, you know, that's extremely good. Now, this is what we really want you to do. They wanted to see if he could do something. And he put together what they call a short sell in the stock market. And it was aimed at companies in Europe that had invested in America that were squawking. One of the companies was owned by the Rothschilds, and it was run by a guy called Blackjack Bovier, who was Jackie Kennedy's father. And he bankrupted them. The short sell worked extremely well for four days, and then they were taking a day off or two days off and coming back to finish it. And in the interim, the country panicked because the stock market was going crazy. Yeah. Because of these short sells. And the country, and it caused the crash. And it, it didn't do it to make the crash. It just was a remnant of it. It created the crash, which made them more money. And after the crash was over, Roosevelt said to Kennedy, you know, you did a great job, kid. Now we want you to run, take hold of the SEC and rewrite all the laws because they knew that Europe had to reinvest back into America to get their money back. And they just changed all the laws in the SEC that made it more favorable for America. And when he did that by 1935, from 31 to 35, they said, boy, what a great job you did. Now we're going to make you ambassador to England. And some people from Chicago grabbed him and said, well, here's the deal, kid. You're going over there to be ambassador to England. We want you to speak to a few people that we know over there, and we're going to tighten the net up. And... First guy he sat down with was the Shah of Iran, who was a gangster. And Kennedy was a very money-making, lucrative-minded guy. So he put together a deal with the Shah of Iran and a few other people, and they were lending money to Hitler. And with the money they lent to Hitler, Hitler came back, and they added a guy called Khashoggi to the same group, and they were selling weapons to him. And England found this out and said, whoa, yo, you're, you're supporting our enemy. And Kennedy said, well, Amer America's not in the war. I'm not doing anything wrong. We weren't in the war yet. And they yeah. said, well, that's our enemy you're supporting. And they threw him out of England. And oh. nobody knew how or why he got thrown out. He only came home as Ambassador Joe Kennedy because there was no television then. And the radio stations were owned by the Murchison family. <clears throat> and, the, and the newspapers were owned by the Gore family in Indiana for the East Coast and Hearst on the West Coast. So nobody printed anything detrimental as to why he came home from England. He came home as Ambassador Joe Kennedy. And then he wanted to make, he wanted to make his younger son, the, the oldest son, Joseph Jr., President of the United States. And this guy was a great pilot, and he was just about ready to leave the service. He had about a month or so less than to, before he was out and then yeah. home. And they put together a group, a thing over in Europe where they wanted to fly a plane, like a kamikaze plane, into the munition factories of Germany to end the war. And they talked him into test piloting the plane. 
and he, because he was such a great pilot, and he test piloted the plane, and the plane blew up, and he died, and the plane died. And, uh, first Kennedy was killed, and they a week later scrubbed the whole thing. They never, they never followed through with what they were going to do. And it was a way of getting rid of a Kennedy. We're getting even with Joe Kennedy. And then so his second the, son. Yeah, so then they get his next son, son right? The president of the United States and uh, Sam Giancana. Joe Kennedy went to Sam Giancana and he said, uh, you know, I, I, I'm going to make my son president of the United States and I need your help. And uh, Giancana said, OK. And he said, and I lend you both of his ears. If he becomes president, you'll have both his ears. And Lansky and people in New York said, Gene Carno, what are you getting involved for? We don't need Kennedy. We already have Nixon. So why are you getting, you know, what are you getting involved for? And he said, no, no, he's going to give, we have both his ears and this should be good. We control Joe and it's all going to be good. And uh, when they started the, when Kennedy came to California for the nomination, Joe Kennedy took a bag of money uh, from the people in Texas they, the oil guys put a bag of money together, gave it to Joe Kennedy to get Johnson to be the running partner for Jack Kennedy. And he went to Gene Connor and he said, "We the nomination's a shoe in uh, We've got the electoral votes. And then after the second day of the nomination, he, he went back to Gene Connor and he said, well, we, we have a little bit of a problem. We don't have as many electoral votes as we thought so. For the very first time, Illinois and two states next to it went Democrat. They turned Democrat and gave him, you know, the votes for the electoral votes. And they still were shy. And there was only one state. After the third day, Joe Kennedy went back again. He said, we're, we're still a bit shy of getting him nominated. And they, uh, the only state that was available that had enough electoral votes was West Virginia. And there were a lot of illegal casinos in West Virginia because a lot of money there because of the coal business. Yeah. And they went to the, to the uh, Cellini family who controlled the casinos there with Meyer. And, uh, and they forgave some debt. And West Virginia raised their hand and Jack Kennedy got nominated. And as soon as he got nominated, now he's running for president. And it was a neck and neck between him and Nixon. If you look back on the election, it was really close, close, close. And it makes me laugh because you, you, you talk about the fixed votes of the Trump thing and all that stuff. And you go back to the Kennedy election and there was, I know for a fact, there were people in counties of Illinois who voted 20 times and they were dead. Yeah, yeah, they're getting people from, from the saying? graveyard to vote. Voted right? 20 times and they were dead. And and he won by a very narrow margin over Nixon. He was a, it was a very close running. Field. And he became president. And as soon as he became president, Meyer and some people in New York were worried about, well, what are you going to do with this clown Bobby? And uh, because Bobby was a thorn in their side already. And they said, what are you going to do with him? And he said, Joe Kennedy said, "Oh no, we're gonna we're gonna send him to Ireland and make him ambassador to Ireland." And Gene Connor said, "Well, that's good." And so they, when he turned around, he whispered in his son's ear. He said, "Make your brother attorney general." And Bobby became attorney general, and his father went to him and he said, "Put all my good friends in jail." And he went after Gene Connor. He went after Hoffa. He went after everybody. Why would he do that? Why would he send them all to jail so he can get rid of the problem? Yeah, he wanted to. He wanted. He wanted to get out from under thumb to Chicago, so they they went after Giancana. They went after. They went after a lot of people, and uh, you know. And then Jack is uh, going down to Dealey Plaza, and uh, four people called Bobby on the phone and said, "Do not let your brother." In fact, Adlai Stevenson went and saw him and said, do not let your brother go to Texas. The animosity down there is terrible. Because another thing that Joe Kennedy did was he whispered in Jack's ear, 
Those oil guys down there, now these are the guys that gave him a ton of money to get Johnson to run for it, right? Those oil guys down there, they're making a fortune off of a product called surplus oil. And they're not paying any tax on it. So you need to tax that product. So Jack figured, well, it's business. And he went down and he put they levied a tax. He went to Congress, they levied a tax on surplus oil. Well, that cost those guys a couple hundred million dollars a year. So they were not happy puppies at all. And the animosity against, and it was all against Joe Kennedy. The animosity was terrible. Well, what people don't realize is that Jack Kennedy was a very sick individual. He was not going to live out his term. He, they used to shoot him up every day because he had suffered from what they call Addison's disease, which is a deterioration of the spinal canal. And he was in a lot of pain. And he also had syphilis and two other diseases. So he was in bad shape. And he wasn't going to live out his term. And his father didn't want to see him die for medical reasons because he figured it would put a mark on the family. And people would say, well, that's kind of cold, man. Why would the guy? But look what he did to his daughter. His oldest daughter, Rose, he, he lobotomized her because she suffered from ADD before doctors knew what to do with that ADD. And she would dance on tables and stuff. She was a bit, she'd get a little loopy every once in a while. And he was afraid she was going to embarrass the family terrible. So he lobotomized her. And she sat in the building looking out the window all her life. And she lived to be a very old woman, but she lived in, in, a, in, a, in a terrible state. So wow. what happened with Jack, you know, uh, he would rather see him die the way he died than die the other way. And uh, he would die like a hero because so here you got a president of the United States in an open car going down Dealey Plaza with the bird building with all these people walking around, windows open and stuff, should never have happened with the president right below you. Then they had people coming off of the train, all these hobos that were walking over that bridge. And one of them was Woody Harrelson's father, who was a hitman for New Orleans. Yeah, he and killed the judge. I know all about that story. <laughs> 32 people in Dealey Plaza that day that could have assassinated him. And there were 13 shots fired. Now you got Zabruder, Zabruder, who never held a camera in his hands in his life, is standing up on a high area with two women holding his legs because he suffered from vertigo, never took his finger off the trigger of that camera while all the gunshots are fired all around him and stuff. And he taped the Zabruder tape. And the Zabruder tape was bought by Life magazine for $150,000 before it was ever shot. So no one saw it for a year, but there was, it was, it was edited. They took eight frames out of it because the eight frames showed the driver take the last shot. And Kennedy got shot three times that day. And they all went with this one bullet theory from the, from Oswald's gun and all this other jazz that they, the Warren commission sold that to the public. And it was all rubbish because there was a prison right across from the War Bird building, and these guys are standing there looking right at that window that Oswald was supposed to be at firing this rifle, a mail order rifle. Okay. Mm -hmm. And there was two dark complected guys and one uh, white guy. So there were Cubans and, 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 a, and a white guy that were in the window. Now, anybody that knows anything about weapons, you're talking about a mail order bolt action rifle and you're shooting a shot of over a thousand feet and the variables were bad because you had the wind in Dealey Plaza was atrocious. Even the cops couldn't hear the microphones and they, you, you had a car moving on an angle, you had trees and signs. So any shooter that's a, that's a sharpshooter would have to arrest his heart down to 60 because your pulse is in your finger and it's on a trigger, and to take three shots of any meaning within 28 seconds on a bolt action gun is bullshit. Never happened. Never with any accuracy anyway. Yeah, you, know? you got to click it, put it and back. It's never going to happen. It just never happened in reality. So, And the fact is that 
if you're shooting him from that window, the car is going by you. It would have hit him in the back of the head and his and in front of his head would have come out. Yeah. yeah. But the first guy that got shot was Conley. Conley got shot and he fell in between the seats. And then Kennedy got hit in the throat. And you see him in the Zabuda film grab his throat and he fell forward. Yeah. And then he got shot in his lower back, and no one ever said anything about that for 10 years. And then the driver took the last shot and hit him right in the front and blew his head, all, and you see him fly backwards in the car, and the back of his head came out. And so the driver all, just turned around? Driver just turned him. rear. He turned around, he, he slowed the car. Instead of speeding up, he slowed the car down to almost 10 miles an hour, cut off the motorcycle cop, and turned and took a shot. And that's on the eight frames. And that, that film's been seen on, on viral. The FBI put it out viral that uh, it shows the driver, because the driver, Greer, did a deathbed accusation that he took that last shot. He made it well known. And uh, so there's a lot of things. That, it was like every 10 years, somebody would come out with another version of what happened down there. Yeah. And you know the the, the cauldron where where John Roselli took the first shot from was a big enough for me to walk from the river to the street. That's how big the cauldron was. And now they've cemented it over. They, they, they because people did a, a documentary on it, and uh, so the whole thing was was a forest about how they and you know when they did the autopsy on Kennedy. It was all spudged over and it was done by interns. It wasn't done by any medical doctors until another 10 years later, somebody explained the fact that he was shot in the throat and then he was shot, you know, and then they have a, a supposedly a jar in a, in a museum with Kennedy's brain in it. And how could it be in there when it was blown out the back of his head? You know, so there's so much, so many lies that were told. And, you know, and Oswald was a total patsy. And, you know, they killed him right coming out of the, in, the, in the garage when, when the Ruby went in and shot him uh, because they wanted him out of the way. And when you see him come out, and they, they, they grabbed Oswald and blamed him for the assassination of Kennedy. And they took him in and they questioned him. There wasn't one tape or one file made up of any of the questions asked him. And you can see yeah, his his eye looks like he got punched in the face. And this is the guy that shot the shot the president of the United States. You understand? So they uh, they got rid of him when Ruby shot him, and, and and Ruby should never been allowed into that garage, especially carrying a gun. That should have never been. That's a no no. But it was all set up to to get rid of Oswald. And when they took Ruby, they locked Ruby up. Ruby, they, they went to Ruby, and they and Ruby said to them. You can't question me here. You got to move me out of Dallas. This is not a safe place to talk to me. And they said, you know, and they left them right there. And they took, there were needles they got from Tulane University, which had a cancer research place. And they shot him up with cancer and they killed him. They died from cancer and he never was sick a day in his life before he went to jail. So, so they eradicated people along the way. So that the Warren Commission would stand up and be boom, this was the gospel, and and that shown to be bull. You know, it's just uh, they've done documentaries now about how Kennedy got shot in different places, and every like every ten years they come out with new stuff, and it's uh, makes me laugh when they all this was there in the beginning, and they just uh, washed it over and they phased it out to where people just you know who cares anymore you know what i mean yeah so has has frank or um has anyone from the underworld ever talked to you about this situation the underworld had nothing to do with his, his death the people people always try to say well it was the it was the mafia it was the cia and because you got to look at what happened in the bay of pigs well, the bay of pigs joe kennedy told his son he said those soldiers can't have any, they can't have any bullets in their guns because if they misfire something, it's going to set off a terrible, a terrible scene. Well, they all got slaughtered. They couldn't even defend themselves. They had no bullets in their guns. They all got killed in the, in the, in the Bay of Pigs. 
And that was because of the missile deal that was done with Cuba. And Joe Kenny was involved in that. And, they, you know, and so it was, it was uh, so the CIA was very, very angry because there was a lot of guys who got killed there. And they, uh, so they were angry. The oil people were angry. There was a lot of people that were very angry at Joe Kennedy and it would, they were going to take it out on his son. And that's what people made it believe that they were the ones who were involved in orchestrating his killing. But that's not true. He was the whole thing at Dealey Plaza was orchestrated by one of the most prolific assassins in Europe, the guy called the Jackal, Carl Sanchez. And Carlos was uh, one. He was, he was a clever, clever guy, boy. He was he was the guy with the umbrella. And he triggered the whole thing off. And he, uh, Carlos was a smart man. And he, he, uh, they, everything was so taken out of out of order about who did this, who did what, where it came from, and who who they were going to blame for this and blame for that. And, and that caused a lot of disarray. And, you know, no one ever really got the truth about what happened at Dealey Plaza that day. A lot of people say Carlo um, Santo Traficante had something to do with it. No, they didn't. Uh, they, they had a lot of <laughs> anger, but they were orchestrated by Carlos Sanchez. And then I know that for a fact. It was orchestrated you know. by Carlos Sanchez. And he was the, he, this guy was so clever. I'll tell you how clever he was. He, he was a, a major assassin in Europe, and they could never catch him. And one time they thought they had him, and he went on a plane as a woman, and he had a prosthesis that built in that, that made it look like he had a vagina and everything. He went through an x-ray thing and all, and and the plane as a woman and walked off as a man. He went in the bathroom, changed the stuff all around, and he walked off as a man. They never caught him. It was uh, he used to you could never see him face to face. He would go he would come into a place as a priest. And the only way you could talk to him was in a confessional. So you never really saw him. You know? He was clever. Wow. He was a smart guy. He was a, he was a pretty smart guy. So let's let's shift it to your acting career. Well, before your acting career, you started with sports. Well, I, I, I played a little football and then I got out of that and went into boxing and uh, and uh, and did quite well in fighting. I, you know, a couple of Hall of Fames and I was California heavyweight champion. And uh, and then when I retired from boxing, I, uh, I I took a young man by the name of Frankie Lyles and I made him super middleweight champ of the world. Uh, and I created a guy named Freddie Roach, who's, who's one of the prolific trainers in the world today. Trained Pacquiao and trained a lot of great fighters. Wow. Freddie's Freddie's a super kid, but they, you know, in 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 the transition of that, when I was in Boston, when I first started out, and I was like ten and zero or something like that, and Steve McQueen came in to do uh, the Thomas Crown affair, and we looked after him, and he and I became very good friends. And he said, "Wow, well, man, you got to come to Hollywood." Come down on a set. I want to put you in the movie. We'll get your SAG card. You'll be, oh, this would be great. I said, uh, I don't think so. I said, I'm, I'm looking to fight Ali for the title one day. And, uh, and I uh, turned it down. And he just couldn't believe I turned it down. And then, then I fought a guy out in L.A., Manuel Ramos, who was ranked number two in the world. And they wanted me to, they came to me to do a fixture called The Great White Hope with James Earl Jones. Uh, to play Jeff Willard, and uh, which would have taken me off the streets for six months. I went to they because they went to Spain and they shot this movie in Spain. It was the biggest movie in Hollywood at the time. So I uh, I turned that down, and they couldn't believe I turned it down. I thought the deal was all made. Just supposed to go in and sign a contract. And uh, I said, uh, I'm ready to fight Ali. You want me to go to Spain for six months? I don't think so. Yeah, and then. Eddie Foy was all upset because Raymond Patriarca was involved in putting the deal together. And they wanted to get me off the streets to protect me. And I said, uh, I don't think so. So I turned it down. And then I, after I retired from boxing, I had an agent in San Diego when I was California anyway, champion. I did a lot of commercials. Yeah. And she called me on the phone and said that they, they want you to do a film. 
and I think you should really do it. I said, what film? He said, Farewell, My Lovely with Robert Mitchum. And I said, well, I looked around. I said, you know, maybe it's time I do this. And uh, I went to Hollywood and they did a screen test. I met the director uh, in New York and then I, they flew me out to Hollywood to do a screen test I did with Harry Gene Stanton. And Mitchum said, it's either him or I don't do the movie. So I blame it all on Robert Mitchum. <laughs> He's the star of your whole career, huh? He was a... He was like he was he was my mentor. He was just a, an incredible individual, and uh, and he, he he taught me a lot. He didn't teach me how to act. He taught me about the business and how things work and what you should do to protect yourself. And, uh, and he was very smart at that. You know, he was he was very clever in the way that he handled myself. And uh, and he just and he said to me the very first day I ever went to work with him. Uh, he designed for us to drive to work together so he could talk to me. <laughs> and when we got dressed in our monkey suits and went over and we were getting ready to do the first shot, he said to me, you read that script, kid? And I said, read it, man. I know your role, my role, Charlotte Rampling, John Ireland. He said, good, throw it in the trash can. I said, what? <laughs> he said, let me tell you something. Don't let me catch you doing what thousands of people do when they come to Hollywood. That's trying to act. Just be yourself. You've been yourself in it, walk down the street like you, and just be real, be yourself. And it worked pretty well, you know? But uh, I remember the first, the first shot that we ever did, and they started moving the cameras around and stuff, and I said to him, Robert, what, what's this all about? What are they doing? He said, you really don't know. I said, what am I asking you for? He said, that's it, kid. That's all there is to this. I said, are you, are you kidding me? That's all there is to this stuff? He said, yeah. I said, oh, man, I'm a star. <laughs> <laughs> and that became like a tagline to the to the, to the the film. And then, then when the first day, we, at the end of the day, I had to do a shot, and he was gone. You know, he was dismissed. And I'm saying to myself, how the hell am I going to get home? I came with him. He's, no way he's hanging around. He probably went home. Yeah. So I go down, I get changed and all, and I said, wow, where's where's the car place? Well, I don't get out of here. So I go around to the carpool joint where they parked all the cars, and there's Mitchum standing against the car, rapping with the driver, smoking a cigarette. And I, when I, I said, wow, man, I thought you were home already. He said, well, I can't go home without the star now, can I? <laughs> I need to bring the star home. <laughs> yeah. And he was just, he just became, uh, we became super friends. And he was just great for my career. That was awesome. Then I went on to do King Kong, and I did a lot of great movies, one after the other. And it so worked what, out pretty well. What came first? After your first movie, what movie came next? King Kong. And how was that? Farewell. I, I made a bad mistake with Farewell, my lovely, because after the film come, was put together and was out, it was a very good movie. And uh, Mitchum said, you know, you can get nominated for Supporting Actor, Jack. And I said, what? He said, yeah, man. He said, I'm going to so he set a meeting up with Johnny Carson at the Polo Lounge. And uh, he said, you go sit down and talk to John, have lunch with him. He said, I, uh, you do his show and you'll, you'll get nominated. So I went and I sat down. And Carson was a great guy. We sat and had a chat and Ed McMahon was with him, and I knew Ed McMahon from Philadelphia. And um, I looked at him. I said, you know, your show is live, isn't it? And he said, yeah. It was in tape then. They, were, they did live shows. I said, uh, I don't think I can do your show. He said, well, what are you talking about? I said, well, I'm going to come out on your show, and you're going to ask me about my father, and I'll ask you where the men's room's at. He said, you would get up and leave? I said, yeah, I would get up and leave. I said, you know, I, I don't want anybody talking about my father. I don't talk about that. I said, and, uh, and I had just come off the streets, and I was worried about what, you know, putting this stuff out on national television, man. Yeah. And Mitchum called me on the phone. He said, are you out of your mind? He said, Jack, this is Hollywood. They love that stuff. I said, yeah, you with your big mouth telling everybody. He said, no, man. He said, you're crazy. You should have done the show. And, uh, and he's right, because his picture is a great movie. And I would have gotten nominated. I had a chance of winning supporting Oscar that year. 
So it was my first wow. mistake in the film industry. But, you know, you, you just go on with life. You could have put you on the spot, though. You never know what could have happened during that well, show. Well, that's the reason why I, I was just protecting myself. It was the way I knew how to do it. And I, just, so, and I did Kong, and I did a lot of great movies. I, did, I worked with some tremendous actors. Uh, I'm very lucky, Jeffrey Bridges and Charlie Grodin when King Kong, and uh, a great cast of people in, in the film. Je Jessica, and I knew Jessica was going to be a star the first day she walked on the set. Oh, you did? Oh, Jessica was, the camera loved her. She was just a, a she was a radiant, great lady. She's, and she is still t today a great lady. So, and, uh, you know, you and I worked with Omar Sharif and Jimmy Coburn and Brando and Gene Hackman. And I did a couple movies with Hackman. And, you know, you just, you're working with great talent. You learn a lot. Chuck Norris was a good kid. I did here in the Terror with him. And then did that with Ackroyd. Ackroyd was terrific. We had a lot of fun with Dragnet. Yeah. He's and it was great Tom Hanks' breakout movie. Tom Hanks' first real big film. Shout out to Tom Hanks. Maybe I could get him on my show eventually. Once good guy. Let me better. tell you, what a, what a super nice guy. Really is. Yeah. Tom's, a, Tom's, a, Tom's a gentleman. He's a good guy. Someday, maybe I'll be able to interview him. Just you know, reach out. Tell him I said hello. He's yeah, a good well, guy. Tom's, Tom's a good guy. Definitely. So once you're doing all these movies, are you getting recognized when you go out in public? What's what's oh, it yeah. like when you go yeah. out? Yeah. I mean, but I just never, you know, it just I had been through all that with sports and everything else. And, you know, so I just uh, I never paid much attention to it. And I never did a lot of publicity. It was another thing that was foolish of me. I should have, I should have done a lot of talk shows and stuff when I was coming up as an actor because I did some great movies and each one was was its own special entity. You know, and I, um, I just uh, I handled it. I, I didn't, you know, I picked and choose what I wanted to do. And yeah, I, I never, I never had to read for a film. People would just. I, I, I automatically was given parts and stuff, and, and it worked out pretty well. You know? Yeah, because they wanted you involved, like because yeah. I mean you're amazing talent, and uh, I mean look at all the movies you've been in. So what yeah. was it like when you got offered to do Superman? What, I was doing a picture. I was doing a picture down in Spain, March or Die, Hackman, with Gene Hackman and Catherine Deneuve, and some great. Omar, I mean, uh, Max and Cedal and Ian Holm, a great cast. And the, the Italian kid in the, that was a big star over in Italy, Terrence Hill. And uh, we were doing that down in Morocco and Spain. And they sent me the script for Superman, and they flew us up to meet Richard Donner, the director. And uh, he said, we really want you to do this film. He said, well, how do you feel about playing a guy the, the character that I was doing was a major scientist and they lobotomized him because he was involved with Zod. So <clears throat> the character was a mute guy. And he said, how do you feel about playing a person who's mute like that and was lobotomized? I said, uh, I embraced that because he said, what? I said, well, I, 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 I said, Jackie Gleason was a friend of mine and he did a picture called Gigo and he won an Oscar playing a deaf, dumb mute. I said, if I ever got a, a role that was that allowed me to use body language and facial expressions, I would embrace it like unbelievable. And this is a great part because Saad is a, is, a, is a vicious general and Sarah is a man eater. Somebody had to relate to the kids because of a big child audience. So I took this big brutish guy and I played him like a child, learning how to work his eyes and, and doing childlike mannerisms. And it worked out very well. Yeah, I mean, there's action heroes of you, and here I'll show you. It worked, really, worked really. I mean, I remember the first time I did a. I remember the first time I did a Comic Con in reference to Superman, and, uh, and a guy come up, a guy come up to say hello to me, wanted to shake my hand and stuff, and and, and I said, yeah, and then we started talking. He said, oh my God, you can actually talk. <laughs> yeah because people think that some of these movies they think it's real like it's real life they don't well, some people don't. I couldn't 
<laughs> so here's an action figure of you. Yeah, they got all kinds of stuff out there. Yeah, he's uh, one of the. It made, us, it made us iconic actors, you know. When we did that, when we did that film, and and the two Superman films, they are the best that were done. You know, they they were they just they they were done so well. And, my, uh, and Richard Richard Donner was such a great director. My mom's yeah. calling. Hello. Shit. My mom was calling. Shit. My mom's car broke down yesterday. Uh oh. Yeah, it's gonna be a, a nightmare. Um, you all right? Yeah, I'm just gonna make sure she's okay. Hey, I'm uh, doing an interview. Okay. Okay. All righty, no worries. All right, bye. Okay, bye. All right. Um. Yeah, she had breast cancer. She's in remission now. She yeah. just going through she live, in, she live in Connecticut as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, I help her out. I, um, you know, and do things for her. But now I got to deal with this car situation. It's just a nightmare. Well, just get a good mechanic. But so she brought it to the car dealership, and they're telling her that it's uh it's this big part, and she has to pay twenty five hundred, and they're trying to milk her. I'm like, <laughs> you know, I'm trying to protect her, but she yeah. doesn't want me to. It's just. I don't even know. Maybe just back off from the situation, or I really don't know. Uh, like a son, you're standing up for. You know what I mean? That's what you're supposed to do. Yeah, you have to because that's what we I do. Mean, we take care of our parents. No one else is gonna do it, right? Right. They took care of you, so it's time for you to take care of them. Yeah. So, do you remember this picture? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's Dragnet. Dragnet. How was yeah. that? Working on Dragnet. We had, we had a lot of fun. Danny Ackroyd was Danny Ackroyd was amazing. He just uh, walked around with an earpiece. He, he did Jack Webb so well, boy. You know, the one liner. You could watch Dragnet 50 times and you still wouldn't get all the one liners that Danny threw out in that picture. It was just, uh, we had a lot of fun. And like I said, it was Tom Hanks' first breakout movie and Tom was great. It was a great cast. I think I'm going to go watch it after this interview. Oh, it's, a, it's a fun movie. It's a fun movie to watch. Yeah, it really is. That's a fun movie. I absolutely love that movie. So yeah, we have a lot of fun. After Dragnet, did you continue? Did you want to keep going with the acting? What was your... Yeah, I did a couple films after that. And I, you know, I, Then I got into writing, and, uh, and I decided I was going to write that book, Family Legacy, and it was time to tell a story, and you know, and, uh, and I would do a, a little film here and there for friends of mine that asked me to do things and stuff. And uh, uh, I, I had a script that I wrote uh, that I'm going I'm to, when we get done doing Family Legacy, I'm going to go do this picture in Ireland called Ballad of a Simple Man. It was a, a film called The Informer done in the 30s where Victor McLaughlin won an Oscar, won four Oscars. John Ford directed it. And, uh, it was a, a classic film. So I took the book and I rewrote another script off of the book and it turned, turned out extremely well. And, uh, and I've been playing with getting it done for 40 years and it's, it's time to do it and get it over with. And I got up to bat a few times where Mitchum was going to come and do it with me and some other people and just something always happened and it just didn't get done. But, uh, it's a great film. It's a great script. And we're, we'll, we'll do it after we do this. That's a family legacy stuff. Yeah, so family legacy. What's the basis of family legacy? That's another godfather. I mean, in fact, it's better than the godfather because it's about the real godfather. You know, so it works out pretty well. You know, it's uh, we're going to tell a lot of truth about a lot of things of changes that happened in the country, you know, from the time my father died. So it goes from my father's death to Kennedy's death. We tell the truth about a lot of things. So it's, it's, and people, you know, people deserve to know the truth about things. And they um, and they, they want to know, you know. They get told yeah. so, much, so much crap by social media that uh, they control people's minds. You know, people sit in front of a television every day to watch the news, and they don't understand that the news is made to make awards. They never really tell you the truth about everything that's going on in the world. Tell you what they want you to know. 
I can definitely see the family resemblance in um, Anastasia. I Abu can was definitely. A he was a trippy man. He was a. He was a, a lot. Uh, he was he was okay. Very smart guy. Yeah, he uh, had had a lot of um, businesses going, and uh, yeah, he was in Pennsylvania. He owned the, he owned the dress factory, <laughs> in uh, outside of Philadelphia. He owned the factory that made dresses for women and stuff. He owned he owned businesses all over the place. He was a pretty clever guy. And you were saying that after he passed away, the lawyer gave you a manifesto of his life. My mother. He, oh, he, he left he left me a whole deal and my mother gave it to me and uh, he left it for me 256 pages of everything that was going on and how things changed and why they changed he saw it coming he you know he he knew what was going on and he was he was on top of a lot of things boy a lot more than people realize um, yeah. and it was uh, it was sort of very sad it was a change of an era you know a lot of things changed after his death, and not for the good, but for the worse. Definitely. So, um, I look forward to seeing this movie in production, and uh, I can't. Yeah, we're gonna have a good time. With it. We got another little film we're gonna do called Red River in in in, uh, in Nevada. It's a horror picture with a great Faust twist to it. And I kind of <laughs> like it a lot. We're gonna do let, that. Let me know. I'll I'll uh, lend a hand any way I can. I'll, leave it, I'll hold a microphone, whatever. <laughs> no job too small for me. <laughs> I hear you, my friend. Nah, you it's, it's, we're going to have a lot of fun. It's uh, uh, when we're building a studio in Nevada, which is going to be great for the industry. So it's uh, there's just a lot of good things that are going to come about by the end of 2023, and yeah. very necessary. And this film is is a necessary film to to put the truth about a lot of things out there. And, and, and it's a real story, you know, and it's going to be, it's going to be good. We have a lot of fun with it. Yeah. A lot of times people try to skew history and they don't know the facts of what really happened. That's so, true. That's very true. It's all uh, good. But so is, is, is there any links or anything that people can check out your book or anything? Yeah, like they, can that? Go to, they can go to familylegacythenovel.com. There's a site that's up in the familylegacythenovel.com. takes you right to Amazon to the book and, and tells a lot of story about the book and what, you know, what this whole thing's about. It's uh, and you said a lot of fun. They can get um, signed pictures and things like that on your website too, right? Yeah, they just uh, they just reach out to me through the website, and I'll uh, take care of business. And if you guys like this type of stuff, go in the description. I'll leave a link there, and you can follow it to his book and all his other stuff he has to offer. And uh, can we do a quick promo before we wrap it up again, like we did yesterday, but things got messed up. Are you talking about I am chatting with the great Bill Stas? 